Uh, you're just about to meet Kate Hoffman. Um, she says in her bio that she always wanted to work for a business that, um, that would improve the world. Uh, and she founded Urban... Oh, sorry, Grow Up Urban Farms in uh, 2013 in uh, the UK, uh, London's first commercial aquaponics urban farming business. Um, Kate wants to prove that food production can not only happen in innovative ways in cities like London, but also make a meaningful contribution to the way we feed people and um, have training and job opportunity spin-offs as well. So please welcome Kate Hoffman. Nervous about this. It's Sunday morning, and maybe on another Sunday morning when you're not sat in the Palladium Theatre in Malmo, you're in the supermarket. Maybe you've made a shopping list for things you need to buy for your meals for the week. Maybe you're still just trying to work out what you want to have for lunch. It's quite likely that if you're in Malmo or in London or in Boston or in Tokyo, the shelves in the supermarket that you're looking at pretty much have whatever you want on them. We choose what we want from the shelves, we pay for it, and we head off. And we don't really need to think about what it took to produce that food that we see on the shelves. But there's really a lot that happens to get all that food onto the shelves in supermarkets. And I don't know about you, but I don't really know what those quantities look like and what it takes. I don't know how many apples you can get from a single apple tree in one harvest. I don't know how much water it takes to grow enough potatoes to produce four portions of chips how much space you need to grow enough wheat so that everyone in this room could have a loaf of bread, or how much fertilizer you need to grow enough tomatoes and make them big enough that I can slice them into a salad and have that in my lunch. But the reality is it probably takes much more, many more resources, more space, more effort, and more time to produce the food that we eat. And the challenge is that when we live in a city, Food is often something that just happens elsewhere. The production of that food happens elsewhere and then by magic turns up on those supermarket shelves when we need it. Most of us who live in cities, especially in the, develop the developed world, we're not growing our own food. And for the most part, we don't want to. We want to be able to buy food that tastes good and is good for us and Maybe some of us also think it would be great if that food was also good for the planet too. And what we actually need is to be able to consume and buy that food in a way that isn't damaging for the environment. And unfortunately, the fact is, a lot of the way that we grow food now is unsustainable. There's a serious problem with our food system that already uses 50% of available land, 70% of available fresh water, creates 30% of man-made greenhouse gas emissions. And at the end of all of that, if you look all the way along the supply chain, from farm all the way to fork, we can end up throwing away up to half of everything that's been grown. That's not a sustainable food system. We have a global growing population and the FAO is predicting that by 2050, between 65 and 70% of people will be living in cities. Those people are going to increasingly demand more protein, and they're going to want to know more about where their food has come from. How are we going to feed all those people in all those cities in a way that is sustainable? We need to find ways to help existing farmers improve the efficiency and environmental sustainability of their production. And we also need to look for alternative technologies and business models to feed those sustainable cities of the future. In fact, it's not really any good thinking about those as things that have to happen in the future. We need to be thinking about them now for our cities at the moment. In 2014, researchers from the University of Sheffield in the UK worked out that some of the agricultural soil in the United Kingdom had only 100 harvests left 
before that soil was completely depleted. There's a serious issue with relying on the types of farming that we've traditionally been doing and how we've been doing it to produce the food that we need for the future. We have to start thinking outside the box when it comes to feeding people. And, as I'm going to tell you a little bit more about today, we can also start thinking inside the box at some of the technologies we can use to produce food and shape a sustainable future for agriculture. And one of those technologies that I'd like to talk to you about is aquaponics. Aquaponics is a combination of two fairly well-established farming practices, aquaculture, farming fish, and hydroponics, growing plants in a nutrient solution without soil. You take the wastewater from a fish farm and you pump that through to your hydroponic growing beds where the plants absorb the waste nutrients in that water. On a farm like this, those plants are grown hydroponically in vertical layers and each layer of plants is provided with the ideal conditions for growing. The light, the water, the humidity and the temperature. The system doesn't use chemical fertilizers, it doesn't need any pesticides, and growing in this environment produces a consistent quality and quantity of food year-round. Aquaponics has actually been around in one form or another for a really long time. Over 400 years ago, farmers in China would flood their rice paddies and fill them with fish. The fish would eat the bugs, they would fertilize the plants, and when the crop was ready to be harvested, the farmers could drain the fields, and they'd have fish and rice with which to feed their families. So, this sounds like a really old technology, why pay attention to it now? Well, as I mentioned, we need to be thinking inside the box, and that's where it actually makes sense to put this technology. By combining aquaponics with controlled environment agriculture and vertical farming techniques, we can bring that whole ecosystem of production indoors. On a farm like this one, you control the lighting, the temperature, the water, and the humidity you create the optimum conditions for the production of plants and fish, and you reduce the environmental impact of growing that produce by optimizing how you use those resources that go into production. Because this environment is indoors and controlled, it means you're not adversely affected by climate change-related weather events. And because you can build this type of system inside a box, inside a warehouse, it means you can look to put this type of production in place in any city around the world, which is exactly what we did in London. In an industrial unit that had been empty for almost two years, we built a farm that was designed to be commercially operated and to show what it was possible to do using industrial space to grow sustainable, healthy, and delicious food. On the right-hand side, you can see our aquaculture system. 12 fish tanks, each capable of holding up to 400 fish. And the water recirculates through those tanks and into our filtration system. That takes out any solid waste. And then the biofiltration converts the ammonia in the fish waste into the nitrates, which are what's needed by the plants. The water then gets pumped over to the other side, to our hydroponics room where, as I mentioned, we're controlling as many aspects as possible of the production system to create the, optim the optimum growing environment for those plants. Once those plants are ready to be harvested, they can be delivered by electric vehicle directly to local customers within the area around the farm. This farm that we built in London, in a building with a footprint of 600 square meters, so probably not massively dissimilar to the size of the theatre we're in today, has the ability to produce 20,000 kilos of salad and 4,000 kilos of fish on an annual basis. Now, that sounds like quite a lot in one go, but if you were to divide up the population and work out how many people that could feed, that would only feed around 3,000 people. So you can see that although this farm looks really big, it actually represents a very small percentage of the potential and the capability for this type of production to have a really meaningful impact on city populations. But the great thing is, as I mentioned, that if you find or build warehouses like this, you can do that anywhere in cities all over the world where you're not dependent on the weather and where you can grow local crops 
that are in demand and required by local communities, and you can design and build those farms to meet that local demand. Let me be the first one to say that it doesn't make sense to grow all your food on farms like this. It certainly doesn't make sense to find space in or around the city to grow grains like corn or wheat when these can be fairly easily processed and transported and stored from agricultural areas and then brought to the urban and peri-urban areas where they might be needed. But it does make sense to grow lettuce and basil and coriander and rocket and any other number of healthy and flavorsome leafy greens that we all need as part of a nutritious diet to stay healthy. Those types of leafy greens don't travel well and they're often serious culprits of food waste as I'm sure you've all experienced where you've put that bag of salad at the back of your fridge only to go back to it in two days time and find that it's gone disgusting and slimy and just needs to be thrown away. By growing those leafy greens closer to consumers, you, the customer, get your salad more quickly from harvest. And that means it will last longer in your fridge and help you cut down on unnecessary food waste. Now, one of the questions I quite often get asked is, hang on, food like that, how is that ever going to taste as good as food that's been grown in the soil? The reality is, Again, for most of us in the developed world, our food system is already highly industrialized. And much of the fresh produce that we buy in supermarkets, especially the leafy greens, especially the fresh vegetables, has been grown hydroponically, uh, relying on fossil fuel-based fertilizers. But the main problem with how that food has been grown is that the farmers who are growing it know that it has to be transported a thousand miles or more to get to the supermarket shelf. And when it gets onto the supermarket shelf, it has to look as good as when it was harvested. So it has to be the right shape and the right size to look good after a thousand miles of transport. It's not being grown for the taste that you might get if it was grown locally. Realistically, when was the last time you cracked open a bag of salad and scattered it across your plate and thought, wow, this is this is the best tasting salad I've had in a really long time. It probably wasn't that recently because a lot of the fresh produce you can buy from the supermarkets just doesn't taste that great because it's not grown for taste. But if you're growing close to your consumers and you don't have to worry about the thousands of miles and the thousands of hours that the produce has to go through to get to your consumers, then those lettuces and herbs can be crunchy and delicious, especially when they're grown using a system like aquaponics where you can reduce their environmental impact. Now, you might have come across vertical farming or urban farming controlled environmental agriculture before. There's quite a lot of hype around it at the moment, and some small companies have raised quite a lot of money to scale their businesses um, with, I guess, what investors are hoping is a technology that's going to save the world. That's an important stage in the development of any industry. But I think we have to be open to the conversations that need to happen along the way as we try and bring this kind of technology to the forefront of the food system and allow it to start to compete with less sustainable and more traditional systems. Food is different from other global sustainability challenges, I believe, because ultimately food is not just about what's on your plate, it's about the people who are eating it. Food is social and Therefore, it's just as much about people as it is about process and materials. So should we should be looking critically at how we can use this kind of technology and what businesses and systems we need to have in place, as well as what the opportunities are for this kind of technology. And here's one of them, one of the challenges. So what should we be producing using urban farms and for whom? We know, as do other businesses who are doing this kind of farming, uh, that you can use this kind of technology to grow really delicious, beautiful, artisanal microgreens. Those really tiny, beautiful little shoots that you might find scattered on a plate at a Michelin-starred restaurant. They're delicious and they're beautiful. And as far as I can understand the science, because they're the early grown shoots, they're also highly nutritious as well. But they're mostly only available on plates in Michelin-starred restaurants. 
And so using this type of technology to grow that kind of food is not necessarily going to have a meaningful impact on food sustainability. And it's not necessarily going to create a more equitable food system or become a means of replacing the traditional production that's used for the more commoditized products such as lettuce or herbs that we might use every day in our cooking. So I believe we need to be using this technology to grow food closer to consumers, to reduce reliance on imported crops, and to reduce the environmental impact of food production. But we have to be doing that in a way that makes fresh and nutritious food accessible and affordable to more people. And that's part of the reason why in our business, we don't just focus on the green side of things, we also have the fish. So, farming fish. You might have some questions about whether that's an ethical or sustainable way to be producing protein. The reality is that since the 1950s, 29% of global fish stocks have already collapsed. Um, and in a rather grim study uh, of catch data published in Science Journal, uh, the scientists predicted that if we continued the fishing rates a pace as we do now, that there's a possibility that by 2048, all of our wild fishing stocks could have collapsed. So if we want to be eating fish as a protein source, we need to be thinking about other ways to produce it, not just through wild catch. And if done responsibly, recirculating aquaculture of the kind that we use in our system is a viable alternative which can produce high welfare, sustainable and very tasty protein. Take tilapia, which is the fish that's most commonly farmed in aquaponic systems and that we produce on our farm. It's a mild white fish uh, that takes on other flavors very well, so you can cook it in lots of different ways. You might have had it already without knowing it in a fish curry. You might have barbecued it whole if you were uh, living in an East or West African country. Uh, you might have had it ceviche if you were in South America. It's an extremely ubiquitously farmed fish. Um, but the most interesting thing about it, and I don't work for any kind of tilapia marketing board, by the way, I just genuinely think it's actually quite a great fish. The most interesting thing about it for me is that it's omnivorous. So a lot of farmed fish has to be fed on wild caught fish, and that has a poor feed conversion ratio, as well as having other sustainability issues around having to catch that wild fish to feed your farmed fish. So for example, if you're farming salmon, you have to feed a salmon around 3.1 kilos of protein-based feed in order to produce one kilo of salmon that you're going to end up eating. But tilapia, you only need to feed them 1.7 kilos of feed in order to produce a kilo of tilapia. And that feed can be made from some really interesting uh, sources of food, not just wild-caught fish, uh, like algae um, or insect-based protein. It's even possible to take food waste products like spent grain from the brewing process of making beer and use that to produce a feed that can be given to fish. So you can really start to break the cycle of unsustainability that currently might exist in some farm fish practices and start producing local and sustainable protein for people. Just a quick thought on that fish that I quite often get asked about. Just in the same way that you might eat a delicious crunchy carrot that's been grown in a field that's been fertilized with cow manure and doesn't taste like cow manure, none of our salads taste like fish poo, even though they've been grown using fish poo. So that's a bit about the type of food that we can produce. As I've already said, I think that food is about much more than just the ingredients. I think it's social. So another challenge to think about for this type of urban farming business is about people. Controlled environment agriculture has the potential to create meaningful job opportunities as part of a sustainable and green economy. But for the future of this type of farming, it's looking increasingly like there's going to be more and more automation involved. Now, that's key to bringing down the cost of production, which is really important, as I mentioned, in terms of being able to produce more affordable food. And it's also the best way to take advantage of that complete controlled growing environment when it comes to producing food that's got better safety and better quality. But better technology probably means fewer low-skilled jobs available in agriculture, which, on the one hand, 
is great, say, for example, if you're worried about the impact of Brexit on your local agricultural labor market, which some of us definitely are, it's not so great if you're trying to claim that urban farming will create hundreds of jobs for hundreds of communities around the world. Once again, there are opportunities here. There's definite opportunities to train and upskill people in this type of work. And it's difficult to separate the technology from the people, the social impact from the environmental impact, because food and farming involves all of those things, and there's no single magic bullet for creating a more sustainable food system. Within that food system, we also have to think about how we're going to get more sustainable food to more people. This is what most of our food shopping, as I said at the beginning, looks like in the developed world. And I would love more people, and I would encourage more people, to grow their own food and learn more about what it takes to grow the food we eat. Apart from anything else, it's great fun, and it's incredibly satisfying to eat something that you've grown yourself. But I also know that a lot of people don't have the time or want to carry on feeding themselves and their families in the way that they currently do. So any type of new business model, new business that's looking at producing food in a new way, has to engage with the existing supply chain, supply chain as well as exploring new routes to market. There's also a real challenge around the current paradigm of cost versus value in food. In countries like the UK and many others, the race is currently to the bottom when it comes to attracting consumers into supermarkets. And when I say that, I mean race to the bottom in terms of price. That's what everybody's competing on. But if we always expect to pay the lowest possible price for our food, then we should expect that somewhere, somewhere along that supply chain, someone or something is getting screwed on our behalf. And for me, that's not a more sustainable food system, just if it's making it cheaper for the consumer at the end. So that's a real problem for businesses trying to do urban food production at the moment, because the reality is that what we grow is more expensive than what can be grown traditionally. Why is that? Well, these farms are new businesses using new technologies. They're kind of like the Tesla of farming, and you have to start with something more expensive and then work on bringing the cost of that technology down. But even once we're able to bring the cost of production using that technology down, we should be advocating, I believe, that the best price to pay for the food is the price that shows its true value, the cost of what it's taken to produce it from an environmental, social, and economic point of view. So once again, even if you've got a great technology and a great business, it's difficult to separate those exciting technological possibilities from the reality of the people who are going to be buying that food. We can create a more sustainable food future, but we can't do it without thinking about the people that we're trying to feed, as well as the food that we're producing. As I hope you've probably gathered by now, I am absolutely passionate about this kind of technology and about using the right kind of technology to grow the right food in the right place. And I believe that that's the only way that we're going to find a way to feed cities more sustainably now and in the future. I think that it's okay to say that salad should be social. It's okay to try and address those complexities of growing food and feeding people and not expecting that technology is suddenly going to solve all those problems. We want people to make better decisions about the food they buy and they eat so we can adopt new technologies and we should be honest and open about the challenges of using those technologies to create a more sustainable food future. And I think... There's going to be some more broader discussion over the next couple of days about different ways that food production can happen in cities. And I think we need to be equally as open to discussion about this type of technology as we do to some of the smaller community growing projects that happen as well. Those projects are a fantastic way of getting people, often from extremely marginalized communities, involved in food production, better access to nutritious food, a better sense of well-being from doing that food production. But those small community-based gardens are not going to be the way that we feed entire urban populations in the future. We have to look at projects of all scales and sizes and get all of the different benefits that we can along the scale of those different sizes. Sustainable technology and sustainable food businesses should be focused on creating edible cities 
that work for everyone, not just for the people who are richest and can afford to buy the best food. Oh, I was doing so well. Look at that, look so, so nearly at the end. So, what does the future hold for urban farming and controlled environment agriculture? I'm not sure I know. I'm not convinced my investors would be terribly impressed that I'm standing up, say, up here and saying that to all of you, but I think that's the reality. We have to be thinking seriously about how we're going to be feeding people in cities, because cities are going to be where the majority of the world's population will be living, and I believe that urban, aquaponic, controlled environment farming can make a key part of the dialogue and action that has to happen around sustainable cities. Building farms in industrialized areas opens up opportunities for collaboration all the way along the supply chain, engaging land developers, local authorities, retailers, and of course, consumers. When you build farms close to people, where they can visit, understand how that food is grown, and when you're transparent about how your production system works, you can reconnect people to how their food is produced, and you can help them make better choices about the food that they buy and they eat. I firmly believe that we've got the capability, the technology, and the innovation to create a food future where the delicious lunchtime salad that you've picked off the shelf in the supermarket or had delivered to your table in a restaurant is grown just down the road, and where you knew exactly what it took to produce the delicious tilapia fish fingers that you had for your dinner. It's been a pleasure to be here today and to tell you a little bit about our business and about what we're working on in London. Um, I'd be delighted to talk to anybody who wants to know more about what we're doing. I'll be easy to spot because I'm basically not taking off this apron as it's the first and last time in my life that I'm likely to wear something designed by Dolce & Gabbana. So <laughs> I'll be easy to find afterwards. I'll be the one in the apron by the coffee and the pastries. Thank you very much. Thank you.